So actually, Sean, I wanted to um, I, I, I wanted to ask you about your start, um, sort of the origin story of your interest in housing, and I think some of it does take place here as an undergraduate. A little bit. Um, so for me, I it was really that I was a kid growing up in the New York City of the 1960s and 1970s, and homelessness was exploding. Um, you know, the I think some journalist somewhere wrote that we were witnessing the death of the American city, and the South Bronx was like the poster child for that. Um, I'm a big Yankees fan. I remember going to the ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning World Series, and seeing the buildings burning in the outfield. And so I, I grew up with this sense that, you know, what the hell are we doing in the wealthiest city in the wealthiest country on earth? And I'm walking by families sleeping on the street on my way to school and like watching the civic bonds that hold places together fraying to the point of breaking. And um, that, that's what got me started. And so I came to college here and um, the Lutheran Church homeless shelter opened the year I started as an undergrad in 83, and I started volunteering there, and ended up, actually, it was, it's interesting, at the Kennedy School, uh, the founder of the National Coalition for the Homeless, a guy named Bob Hayes, uh, the New York Coalition for the Homeless, which became the National Coalition, spoke, and I went up to him afterward and said, what can I do, and went and worked for the National Coalition for the Homeless uh, right after college. So that was, that was my way in, initially, to to these issues, to the to housing issues and the urban issues. Um, what's also interesting, and this goes to the Joint Center for Housing Studies, I was an architecture student here. I thought I wanted to design affordable housing, and that was the way I was going to help solve the crisis. And I took a housing policy class at the Kennedy School, taught by a guy named Bill Apgar, who was at the Joint Center for Housing Studies. And you know, I expected to go in to have a conversation about housing policy. And we spent the first three days talking about race and class and neighborhoods. It was like a fist fight almost broke out in class. <laughs> and I was totally hooked. It was like, oh my god. And this, this really goes to this issue of housing matters, that you know, where you live determines almost everything in your life, right? Where you work, where your kids go to school, your public safety, so many things. And at that point, I was, I was really hooked. And um, it was, uh, I, I, ironically, uh, I was at the Kennedy School of Government, for God's sakes. I never thought about going into government. So I went to work for a big nonprofit in New York doing housing work. And because Bill Apgar um, got a job at HUD, I went, he asked me to come work for him. And I thought, oh, you know, we just bought a brownstone in Brooklyn, and I'm not going to go down to DC. And so I agreed to go work for him. A few months in, I was completely hooked on public service at that point. I became a, a public sector junkie from, uh, from that first experience. So, I mean, plenty of people grow up in affluent neighborhoods aware that surrounding communities don't have those same privileges. I'm wondering if you could just go a little bit deeper in trying to explain what it was. In, was it a moment at the Lutheran Church? Was it that class moment? with? You know, where it seemed like a big, interesting brawl on top of everything else. What, what compels you, um, in a way, to embrace housing as a, as kind of life's work? Um, I think my first, the, the earliest experience that really was about getting beyond this sense of anger I had or the like sense of injustice about it um, was really this experience in the homeless shelter. And the, I think the, the sense that the stories behind every one of those people uh, that are so easy. One of the experiences I, I will always remember is walking through Harvard Square and passing a homeless person. And it was one of those experiences you know, it becomes so 
you, you become numb to it in a way that you don't even see people. And I sort of looked back, and it was an elderly African-American guy holding a picture of himself in uniform. And this, this sense that somebody can't even see you for being a real person, but for holding a picture of yourself as a soldier um, was the experience I had in the homeless shelter of, of, for the first time, seeing beyond the sort of image that we have of, of the homeless, this sense of, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, probably pity to some degree. Um, if I'm honest with myself, that that was, you know, that was part of it. To, to, to something that was much more, you know, these are real people who have gotten, you know, a tough lot or something's happened, but also who, you know, need to take responsibility or have made these mistakes. That there, there was a complexity that that just, I think, hooked me into it in a way that, um, I don't know, it just got a hold of me and didn't let go. So um, those early impulses to, uh, you know, become an architect, you're going to build a, affordable housing, um, as ambitious as that must have seemed at the time, it ends up being in the arc of your career, um, maybe a, a more modest version <laughs> of what you were trying to um, address or, or to solve. And this is a, a very abrupt, um, quick uh, space spaceship ride to uh, the future, but you... Um, you become HUD secretary at a moment of, you know, one of the uh, the most pronounced crises um, in housing um, in in the nation's history, one with little precedent, and you yet you describe describe it as a dream job. Um, and I'm wondering if you can describe uh, or recall for us what it was about managing that crisis that that was appealing. Yeah, it it sure didn't feel appealing at the time. <laughs> I remember. Um, Do you think about saying no to the president? Um, no. <laughs> but I do remember I flew out to Chicago in December of 08. Um, he announced my nomination in Chicago. And I made the mistake, it was on a Friday, and I made the mistake of getting on a flight from O'Hare to LaGuardia on a Friday afternoon, which is like bad, <laughs> bad idea. And I hadn't slept in a few days. You could imagine, like. Um, Try midway next time. Yeah, right. <laughs> a little bit easier. And you know, we were circling for like two hours <laughs> around LaGuardia. And I, I had moments of thinking, like, maybe I should just try to, like, make the plane crash or something at that point. Like, that might be a better ending than what I'm about to, about to do. So it, it was, you know, it, it's hard to describe what it, what it feels like, where you're in the midst of crisis. And lit, I mean, literally every day, we were making decisions and announcing things that were like on their own would have been the most significant thing in a ministry. Like, oh, today we're trying to save the auto industry, and tomorrow we're trying, you know, we're announcing a multi-billion dollar plan for foreclosures, and then the next day it's credit card, right? It, it was just, um, and, and, you know, human beings sort of adapt to crazy things. It was just one of those things where I think we all felt like, you know, we're in and we're going to, do this, and the, um, the, 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 I guess the way I, I often describe it is um, how I feel about public services. I don't like my job every day, but I love my job every day. That there's a uh, sense of as hard as it is, as brutal as the decisions, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And um, you, there's, there's a fine line between when you stop to think about what happens if you make a mistake or the impacts if you get it wrong um, that can paralyze you and sort of having to persevere through that, but at the same time 
the sense that you don't want to become numb to the to the risks and the I, I my part of the way I I remember literally the very first time I uh, was I, my wife moved to DC with a young baby the first time I worked in the public sector I was at HUD the first time and I remember sitting at my desk late at night literally and I'm not kidding about this a stack of letters from little old ladies in Iowa that was what my inbox was filled with and it was a group of letters from a housing complex in Iowa that was in terrible condition and was about to you know get closed down and they were writing basically saying you know help me save my home and I remember thinking to myself that I could be selfish and go home to my wife and son or I could stay and try to do something about this and I thought god I got to figure out how to deal with that Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to do this job. And in some ways, that the crisis was just a much, much larger version of that space you live in between paralysis and you know having to go to the next decision and having to keep keep pushing. And it's a it's a, it can be a very tough thing, but human beings figure out how to get through tougher things. So, so one of the things about crises is um, they. They change us, they have an impact on us, although we're rarely faced with the same crises again, yeah. right? The next crisis is always a new one. Um, but that one of, was of such scale and such historic proportion. And I'm wondering, what were the lessons for you, but also for the nation, and have we learned them? Or do you ever fear we're at risk for, again, not the same crises, but um, some manifestation of some similar set of yeah. things gone wrong? So I, I guess two different ways I would answer that question. One is that um, the, the danger, I think, often in a crisis like that or of that magnitude is the hesitancy or overthinking of, of decisions. And I think the, it's interesting, Ben Bernanke, after I think making some serious mistakes leading into the crisis um, was pretty heroic in the crisis. He was a scholar of the Depression. I think he understood, because he had studied some of those lessons to be learned uh, about what, what, what wasn't done, what didn't go far enough. Um, and I think, if I'm, if I'm honest, there were places where we probably thought too long, compromised too much. And the truth is, particularly in a situation like that, and look, we saw it. I think the president understood this in the politics of the decision making room, that whatever decision we made, we were going to piss off a large group of people. I mean, a lot of people don't remember this, but Rick Santelli, uh, on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, a lot of people date the beginning of the Tea Party to his rant against helping losers with their mortgages, right? And we had a lot of discussions within the administration about you know, the moral hazard if we go too far. And I always remember Ben Bernanke saying something, which was when the firefighters go to a house that's burning down, they don't ask whether the fire started because somebody was smoking in bed. They put out the fire because the house next door could burn down. And I think one of the lessons I, I took is that, um, and I, we learned a little bit the hard way and some of the housing things, is that we should have actually ignored the criticism, been more aggressive, and, and be able to say, look, I know this is going to bring some bad political consequences. We know that there are big risks to this. But when you're in the midst of a, a crisis, you have to break that. I think in terms of the whether the system has changed, whether it, we're at the same kind of risk, um, I feel pretty good that most of the worst risks we did something about. And, and just to make it very simple, 
in the crisis, it was legal to make a loan to someone who could not pay it the day the loan was made, right? How crazy is that? And at least today, you could uh, stop that through the regulations and the laws that were, that were put in place. Um, I believe the financial system is safer. I believe you know, we have a Consumer Protect, uh, Financial Protection Bureau that is doing good work on um, ensuring that some of those same products just couldn't be made today. So I do think that we are in a changed world and that risk has been lowered in a range of different ways. I think that the two things that to me stick out as kind of big remaining issues. Um, one is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And I spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And we got very, very close to getting a significant uh, reform bill done. I am worried that we might go back to the, the old, um, revert to the old system in a way that would really ignore the, the lessons of the crisis. The other one that I think is a, is a larger um, philosophical, uh, moral, um, but also economic and policy question is just around home ownership itself. And um, just to, to put it starkly, we still we spend today about eighty-five billion dollars a year helping families that earn more than a hundred thousand dollars own homes. And particularly in a world where we're seeing some, you know, brutal budget proposals, I, I think we've got a pretty important question to be asking ourselves of I, and don't get me wrong, I believe home ownership is a is a good thing. But the irony of our current policy is we spend a huge amount of money on people that already own homes. And the family that is scraping and saving to buy their first home that's renting today probably can't, doesn't get anything because they don't itemize their deductions and therefore can't claim the mortgage interest deduction. And so we, we have a system that supports home ownership in a way that, you know, I'm not. I'm comfortable that we should be doing something to support home ownership. I think there's good data to show that home ownership actually does help kids, and you can hear more about that from uh, researchers that'll be here over the next couple of days. But I, I do think we have a system that's set up in a way that doesn't accomplish our goals and spends a huge amount of money um, when we could be spending it better on the affordability crisis that we have for the lowest income folks in this country. Well, there'll be other questions about um, journalism, but I, I, I did want to ask uh, one related to this, and that is, um, uh, I think, you know, we've, we've all, there, this is an example of uh, covering of, that, of that, that crisis, that the housing crisis, the financial crisis, um, sort of exposes journalism, uh, some of the, the problems with, with, with journalism, which is, um, you know, that it may not always be built to identify and tell the, a story of that complexity before, before it becomes the bombshell, and that we struggle even during the, uh, un, you know, the, the revealing of that story to understand it in all its complexity. And you, know, you can think about Michael Lewis you know, riding in on his horse with the big short or something, but that's sometime later. Um, and I'm wondering how you, uh, how you experienced uh, journalism um, during that, and maybe it wasn't something you were uh, very much focused on, but I think from, from this end, it was, a, it, was, it was something we were struggling with. Yeah. Um, first, to comprehend, and second, to then be able to describe to readers or viewers or listeners in a way that helped them make decisions and understand what was happening in the country. Yeah, so I, it's, a, it's a great question. I think, look, part of it, part of the result of being in the midst of a crisis 
right at, of that magnitude right at the beginning of the administration is we did not spend a lot of time explaining what we were doing. You know, most of us didn't have press folks or communications people on board yet. I mean, it was, um, so I think there was definitely, a, we could have done a better job explaining or communicating. But I think the deeper issues, one, you know, housing is enormously complex. And the mortgage crisis was, you know, a, a huge part of the problem was that these incredibly sophisticated, well, maybe they're not, we weren't sophisticated in the end, but these inc incredibly complex financial instruments were taking these mortgages, dividing them up into tiny pieces that were owned all over the world. And so when the shit hit the fan and somebody had to make a decision, like, can we write down the mortgage? This, you know, poor family somewhere can't pay their mortgage and it would be in every, like literally it was in everybody's financial interest to keep that family in the home in most cases, but you couldn't get there because of the ownership structure and these, you know, um, the pooling and servicing agreements and all, it, it was a very hard beat to cover and to, and to unwind. And so I do think in a world where the journalism industry has been challenged, where you know, fewer and fewer papers had folks that were on housing beats and you know, really, uh, I, you know, I can think of a handful of reporters who I think really did spend the time and, and get a lot of, of stuff right. I think that would, but it was, it was hard. I think the other thing is just the, um, I felt frustrated at the, uh, you know, we, we, I think we often talk about the pace of the current turnover for journalism that, you know, you got to have the story ready the next day. You got to beat the other, uh, whatever outlet it is, to the story. And having a story that has a longer arc to it, to be able to to be covered in a way that gets to the bottom of it, is really hard. And so, just you know, here we were standing up a program that was the largest housing rescue program since the Great Depression from scratch. I mean, this is one of the crazy things about, like, we literally had to start it from scratch in the middle of this. It wasn't like we had an existing mortgage rescue program that we could just pump a bunch more money into or scale up. And most of the story was about, like, oh, it's two months in, and you've only reached 1% of the folks that you said you were going to, like, well, what's the standard here, right? I, I've ha what's the right number? That, but so much of the focus was about, you know, well, you know, we want to see results right today. And it, it was, there was no reasonable expectation that we could deliver on that. And so that longer, longer arc of what's the right expectation here, what, can, can you wait to write this? story, or is there even a story to be written, even though it's a big issue now, um, was, was frustrating to us in trying to you know, explain, well, look, what, what's, the, what's reasonable to expect here, given the scale of the problem that we're trying to undo, and that we've got to get to, we've got 7 million individual transactions we're trying to do here, which means interviewing with them and, and, and other things. I think the other part of that issue, and I think this was an interesting, again, this was part of the, what we grappled with that goes to the Rick Santelli point, is um, there, was a, there was a moral question at the heart of this of who should be helped. And I think the, the difficulty was that if we tried to make too fine a set of decisions, right? Who deserves, who doesn't? You know, should it only be homeowners who live in their homes as opposed to investors? Or you know, should it only be families who 
we know if they get a, a modification on their mortgage that they can, they'll be able to stay in their home longer term. All of those things require, well, you've got to go and talk to the family and they've got to fill out paperwork and all of those other things that were related to the design of the, the program, but there was very little, th these are families where they're getting dozens of pieces of mail today. They're being foreclosed on a day. They don't want to even open their mail. Lots of them are paralyzed by embarrassment, or but very little, I think, understanding that, well, of course it's hard to reach them, or of course it's hard to, and, and those were the kinds of things that, um, to me, it felt like the, the pace and the cycle of journalism were, it was hard to take account of. I just want to follow up on one thing you said. I think it's interesting that given the scale of the story um, and the importance of you know, the country understanding what was happening, you, you said that you, know, you didn't have a, a press person. Um, was, was, was that conversation at all baked into to how, to how you and um, others in the Obama administration were thinking about um, communications? Was it just like it was a nuisance over here, we've got this thing to fix? Or, um, or did, you not, did you not see it as an, an integral part of what you had to manage in speaking to the country? Yeah, I, it, it was not, look, I'm not saying there were no press people in the administration at that point, but we, we announced our housing program on, it was President's Day week, um, so February 2009. So it was a few weeks after the inauguration. There, there literally wasn't time to hire down to the assistant secretary level or to build a, so it was really, it was, it was much more of a, like, we're literally at the very beginning of the administration and it's really six months before I think you, it, obviously it varies depending on, on the administration, but it's many months before you have a full team on board. So um, I think it was more that than, than anything. So um, there was a little news today. There was a new administration's new budget. Um, and uh, looks like about $6 billion in cuts um, to your former agency, to HUD which is um, a 13% uh, reduction. It includes eliminating the Community Development Block Grant Program, which is currently funded at, you would know, probably th $3, three billion. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, Mike Mulvaney, the OMB director, said, the president said he was going to go after wasteful and duplicative programs, programs that simply don't work. A lot of those are in HUD. We've spent a lot of money on housing and urban development over the last decade without a lot to show for it. Certainly there are some successes, but there are a lot of programs that simply cannot justify their existence. And that's where we zeroed in. So you've held both these jobs, actually. Um, you've run HUD and you've been uh, Mick Mulvaney. Um, do you have any sympathy for, for, for what he said? I mean, is, was, is that a, is it, was that a fat budget? Did it, uh, was it time for these cuts? Um, is that a fair assessment? Or? You want to guess my answer? <laughs> um, no, it's not right. Um, the at, at the end of the day, and let, let's just step back here because I, I I think these budget proposals are dead on arrival. There is no way you're going to get 60 votes in the Senate for the vast majority of uh, what's, what's in these budgets. Um, but he, here's, here's the bigger picture, right? We, as a, uh, as a country today, spend less on the whole non-defense discretionary side of the budget, right? So that's HUD, that's you know, basically all the safety net programs except for the entitlements. It's our science research, it's uh, all the program, education programs 
We spend less as a share of our economy today than we have in 50 years. And lots, you know, this is not just Democrats. Most Republicans would tell you that cutting non-defense discretionary, which is the only thing that was in their budget, they didn't have any entitlement stuff, no tax stuff. It, it's just not, it's not where the money is, and we're already spending too little uh, in that area. Conversely, if you really want to solve, and there are fiscal challenges, if you want to solve the fiscal challenges, you look at the entitlement side and you look at the tax side of the budget. And at the end of the day, um, the, we'll see what they propose in those areas. But I, I don't think these budgets will get enacted. But the, the existential risk that HUD and every other agency is, is facing is that if he's successful in getting increases to defense and VA, if there is a significant tax cut and there are no changes on the entitlement side, you're looking at I mean, the math just doesn't work. And so you will see potential, I, I mean, I think the worst cuts we've seen in our lifetimes to not just HUD, but every single safety net program. Look, look at what they propose as a cut to NIH, right? There's, in a time of intense partisanship, everybody in Congress just about agrees we ought to be investing more in scientific research. And yet huge cuts to, to NIH. So the, the issue here to me isn't the HUD budget specifically, as much as I care about the, the HUD budget, and, and I think you'll hear the important work that we can now prove these programs have done. But it's really about this larger question of what happens on the tax side, what happens on the entitlement side. Two, two other just specific things I would say. One of the things that's really been lost in the healthcare debate is, you remember President Obama used to say all the time at the beginning of this, we want to bend the cost curve, we want to bend the cost curve. The single most important thing you can do, other than make a fairer tax code to, on the fiscal side, is bring down the growth of healthcare spending. We've had the lowest growth in healthcare spending in 50 years over the last few years. And a lot of that is because of a focus on delivery system reform, changing the way we pay for healthcare, paying for quality and not just quantity. And I worry a lot that if you undo a lot of the, the best things about the Affordable Care Act, you will not only have tens of millions of people that lose coverage, but you're actually going to see healthcare costs start to rise again quite quickly. This, all the focus on you know, premiums have been going up. So healthcare costs have been rising more slowly over the last five years than they have in decades. And so that's a, that's a big issue. The other thing I would just say about the HUD budget is 90%, close to 90% of the HUD budget today, pays just to renew the annual subsidies of people who are living in affordable housing today. So it is a, I, I don't, like, I support the block grants. I, su I, I think the cuts to the programs that they're talking about don't make sense. But there isn't much to cut in the HUD budget at the end of the day. And, and over the next, as, as years go by, that, the pressure is going to be even greater just to be able to keep folks in their homes. So if you see substantial cuts to the HUD budget, what you're going to start to see is people losing their homes. And there is, you'll hear a lot of the evidence over the next few days, there is extremely good evidence now that over the long term, having decent, affordable housing, rental or home ownership, makes a huge difference, particularly in neighborhoods of opportunity, makes a huge difference in the life outcomes of kids and, and families. That's what's going to get cut at the end of the day if you go after the HUD budget in a significant way. So one of the great things about this week is we'll also have the chance to hear from Scott Keller, who's um, 
who's with us, uh, and um, Scott, for those of you who don't know or haven't um, met him yet, um, was a senior advisor to Donald Trump, um, to, to President-elect's presidential transition team, um, and he was um, uh, particularly working on the nomination and confirmation of now Secretary uh, Ben Carson. And so I'm wondering, Sean, what advice um, you would have for him um, and the new secretary, and I'm wondering whether you've shared any of that advice with them yet. Uh, I have. Uh, Scott and I have known each other and worked closely together over a, a long period of time. Uh, had had a chance to spend some time together. Um, look, I my view of Ben Carson, without you know saying too much about the private meeting, is he's doing the job for the right reasons. He cares a lot about uh, communities like where he grew up and seems genuinely interested in trying to make a difference in places that we have that are still, you know, uh, Detroit's making a comeback in a lot of ways, but is got, you know, deep challenges. And that's true of a lot of communities around the country. So um, I also think you know, one of the interesting things about housing is that over the last, leave aside the fight we you just talked about on the on the budget and how much money is spent. Housing is a place where there's been an enormous amount of uh, kind of convergence in the way we think about the policy. We have a lot of good evidence about what works. Um, you know, I was, I was laughing with somebody, I think it was David Brooks of the New York Times, saying, help me understand this. Why is it that vouchers are like a third rail in education, but everybody loves vouchers in, in housing, right? Um, we get, you know, we've moved from public housing to public-private partnerships. Um, there's a huge nonprofit sector that is deeply engaged in housing that's you know generally supported Republican. It, you, you go to the committees, the housing committees. There's there's disagreement about Fannie and Freddie and a few things, but generally speaking, for most of the programs at HUD, um, there isn't a huge amount of disagreement. So I actually think if there are resources, there are there's progress that we can make in a range of areas. I think fair housing is one area where you'll see potentially some. Uh, fireworks and some some disagreement, um, but I, I, I think the agenda is not unlike many other departments. I don't think it's one. My, my I don't want to speak for Dr. Carson. You'll have a chance to talk to uh, to Scott, but I don't I don't see this as like a sea change in policy, except for potentially a couple uh, a couple areas that I would that I would worry about. That I feel strongly we took them in a in a good direction. So I don't, to, to me, it's not so much about the fights that you may see on a, on a policy level, although there may, may be some. To me, the, this budget issue is uh, one of the big issues. And then I think you have, to me, a lot of the most interesting fights in the housing world are things that are taking place at the local level. And you know, the, the larger trend that we have is that particularly in, in certain areas, housing is getting to a place where you are literally excluding huge parts of the population from being able to live in uh, neighborhoods of opportunity, to live close into jobs. And that challenge is one that I think is more extreme than you've seen in a long time. And particularly with the nimbyism, the racial and other uh, fights that you have going on in, in some communities. I think those kinds of stories are ones that, um, that's where the, the conflict and the, and the disagreement tends to be um, compared to what I would expect to see at HUD. So I think that you started the budget. I think that's the place that's really going to determine a lot of you know, what's going to happen at HUD. So I'm going to open it up to the room um, in, uh, in, in just a second, but I wanted to um, ask you just to say a little bit more about that. You're, you're in a room full of, of journalists who write about these issues. What are, um, what are some headlines 
you think we've missed? What are some um, stories that are have been under the radar that you think really bear bear some scrutiny? Yeah. So. Um, Let me just say, let me say generally. I want to go back to something you said earlier about um, you know what are the things that journalism is structured to do and set up to do. I think the if you're a journalist, particularly working under tight deadlines, following stories, I think the the tendency is naturally to write about the story that's in front of you. What's, what is visible? And to me, some of the most interesting and complex housing challenges, and, and some of the best journalism I've seen around uh, housing, tries to get beyond the problem that's visible that day. What do I mean by that? Um, Homelessness is a really interesting example where um, our huge advance in, in homelessness, because we've, we've made veterans homelessness is down by half around the country over the last five years. Chronic <coughs> homelessness is down by a third, I think, over the last five years. Chronic, chronically homeless are folks who are, live on the streets for long periods of time uh, or in shelters. Um, and the big sort of leap forward we made, this, and this sounds simple, but we started to kind of disaggregate the homeless to really think about the different challenges that different folks on the streets were, were facing. And it turns out that the chronically homeless are very different than most of the homeless. And um, a huge part of the human suffering, a huge part of the cost for the, the public is around folks who are on the street for a long time. But just a, a little thought experiment here. If you're a reporter and there are 99 homeless families on the street and one chronically homeless, you're going to write about those families, right? That's the problem. But if those 99 families are homeless for one night or two nights, and the chronically homeless person is going to be homeless for two years, that actually, that would make you understand, right, that that's 700 days of shelter costs. But also, the family that's homeless for one night, the impacts on those kids, on their lives, is just fundamentally different, right? Um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a story in The New Yorker called Million Dollar Murray almost a decade ago that was one of the best pieces I've ever seen um, and really actually changed, I think, the momentum around homelessness, really contributed. Because he was able to figure out, rather than starting from the story that was right in front of him, he started with the research. He started with the whole, started with the research, and was able to come back and find the example, find the story that really demonstrated this larger story of what we were figuring out. And so in, in homelessness policy, we ended up really concentrating different kinds of resources on those chronically homeless. We started prioritizing them. And most interestingly, in some ways, for this story, is it was a really interesting moral question, right? What we started to figure out is that for somebody who's been on the streets for two years and has you know, addiction, mental illness, we used to kind of say, well, look, we'll put you in a treatment program. And as a sort of carrot, if you do well, will reward you at the end of you know, the two months or the six months by giving you some place to live. It turns out that's absolutely backward. That it's really hard to take your medication or to get off drugs when you're living on the streets. And that what we really ought to be doing is giving that person a, a place to live first. 
But what does that mean? That means, I mean, I remember going to meet with the new Veterans Administration secretary the first couple of weeks of the administration to try to sell him on this, we call it housing first. He's like, well, so let me get this right. We're going to give apartments to drug addicts and alcoholics without, you know, telling them they got to get sober first? He's like, yeah, it works, right? So that, all of this was part of this story that if, if you just look at what you see on the street in front of you on any given day, you wouldn't notice that you know, the, the 5% or the 10% of the folks that are on the street are actually the largest share of the human suffering and a largest share of the, the policy issue. That if you could solve that, many of those families actually will figure out how to find place to live, right? And that's, that's a policy story that's hard to see from the immediate, you know, the picture that's in front of you. I, another way to think about it is, you know, I go to community meeting. I used to go to community meetings all the time in my, in my old job in New York. And, you know, we'd get yelled at and screamed at by, you know, we don't want this new affordable housing in, in our community or, and I would often think, well, you know, who's writing the story about the family that will live in that apartment two years from now? We, you can't, right? We don't know who they are. Uh, they haven't applied yet. And it's, often I felt my job was to think about and represent the voices of folks that weren't in the room but cared deeply, would had a deep interest in the decisions that we were making. And I, I think the question for, I often ask about journalism is, is how do you write the story about the person that's not in the room but whose interests are deeply engaged or, or, the, the, or about the, the thing that hasn't happened, right, or the thing that was avoided? Because if you're writing about the thing that's in front of you or the, the conflict that's, that's there in the moment, you can often miss these longer term, you know, uh, stories. Raj Chetty's work, which is, you know, using big data to show the impacts over decades of neighborhoods. Hard to find a particular moment or a particular story that would say that changed that kid's life, and yet the cumulative impacts are, are huge. And so, to me, as, as I think about some of the most interesting things that are happening in um, in housing policy, what we're learning from big data and these long term, it, it is the how you write about the thing that isn't right in front of you um, is, a, is a really interesting challenge. It's one of journalism's jobs to see around corners, right? Yeah. And it's, it's a hard thing to do. So um, I'd like can I to. Just, can I do one yeah. other thing? So um, you asked about a, a headline. So let me just go back to my moment as growing up as a kid. Um, New Yorker, the famous headline, Ford to City, Drop Dead. You, we all remember that one. So I, I, the headline I would write is City to Ford, Back from the Dead. I, to me, you know, we've had a lot of focus on what's happening in rural America, and rightly so. I mean, this, the opioids epidemic is uh, devastating. It is... The idea that we have a whole group of people whose life expectancy is going down in a first world country, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's unprecedented from opioid addiction and all these other things. But, but the other story about what's happened in urban America and the recovery that we've seen in places like the South Bronx in, you know, compared to the South Bronx I remember, the, the growth that's happening in cities, the South Bronx lost uh, Seventy-five percent of its population, I think, maybe more than that, in the 1970s, and the repopulation, the growth in cities, the success of many urban places in the U.S. to me is a really interesting story. That um, I think we see it in our election results this past November. That isn't getting attention, in my view, too.